and and like a protocol has been established then people start to build applications like that's that's what happened in the early 2000s uh with like you know likes like google and yahoo and and others who who have like started like these applications that people started to use and things have evolved then came like facebook and and you know <laughs> every other uh, website that you sort sort of use today is sort of like matured from that foundation layer which was set in in the you know late uh, 1980s so think of it that way so like web3 uh, you need like a solid like underlying layer that sort of enables all these interesting applications to be built on top of it that are going to stay like and sustain uh, in a long term basis it's not like you know after 2 3 years it's going to go obsolete so think always about like the long term game and choose like blockchain platforms that let you do it for instance subst substrate is upgradable like it's like you can upgrade the code just the way you you upgrade like your apps on your phone right so uh, if something something new comes up or you know let's say people have uh, hacked into like all the cryptographic algorithms or or whatever so so for whatever is going to happen you should be prepared and then you should uh, look at like platforms that let you be more flexible and and stay like more relevant uh so that would be my advice for somebody who is venturing into into like web3 so uh, again like education is 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 a is the most important part uh take a look at like technology forget all the hype see for what it is and what it can achieve uh mm -hmm. and then try to integrate you know the awesome features that that it can give you uh you know the attack resistance the fault tolerance and you know uh collusion resistance and uh bring all of these in into uh, the application that you're trying to build that's a great great answer once again and i mean that's it i mean that's key isn't it i think at, at these times where it's moving quickly and you've got that that element of the fear of missing out in in some perspectives i think mean, it's very stabilizing to have that long-term view i mean these are one of the things i know this is not web free example but i see often with amazon uh you know they had it was somewhat a 20 year vision of you or something. And even though they were maybe not getting a profit or making huge amounts of revenue, they had this kind of vision as a, uh, as a magnet. So I think that's very, for me personally, that's one of the big things I've taken away already, already from, from what you mentioned. So, um, so actually we just got a couple message about connection. Um, let me just double check that it's, it's back on always good. Uh, technology i mean that that's us back on guys sorry if you lost the connection just there for a moment and uh, let us know in the stage chat that you're that we are back uh and then we'll, we'll continue with uh some some q and a's because we get your questions already you had as well so I'll, I'll jump in from from the audience you might see more to see so we're looking sure, forward to that um, but yeah i'll just yeah, get I'm bracing myself um and uh we'll just come back on very shortly can you guys hear us okay? Um, let us know that you can, and then we will start again. Just make sure you're not missing anything. Okay. Let's come back on. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a tech uh, event without some, some small technical things in between. So sure. <laughs> I think we're back. And, and I'll go on the record, like, Web3 can't solve this problem, right? So <laughs> there are a few player problems Web3 can't solve, and it's one of these. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Fantastic. So let's do a few Q&As then, We've got some good ones already. And what's really good is that tends to happen with Q&As. Once you ask one or two, you'll get a real flood of uh, additional questions to, to bounce off it. So one thing that Denise has asked actually is about the, the decentralized aspects and how it's user-driven, which is obviously real positive. Uh, aspects of Web3. So she was saying it will have the big players whose main purpose is mining your data to make money uh, quietly, <laughs> tripping you up wherever possible. How would you deal with that? I mean, that's really interesting. Like, how would you approach that that issue? Sure. Um, I mean, so block. So if you're uh, if you're saying like the big players are going to like do some analytics on on like the blockchain data and then look at so first of all like like let me like back back down and and say like what's happening right now 
So right now, like every single person who signs up on, on internet is, is given like an identity. So big players sort of make, make these, uh, you know, classify you as one person or the other, uh, profitable, or, you know, we don't have to show ad to this person or something like that. So they put you in these like brackets and then do some kind of targeted, uh, advertisement or, you know, uh, things that, that, that are going to increase like their profits. Uh, the same thing can, can happen on, on like blockchain data too. Uh, but again, like there are solutions that, that will, uh, let you like be like more anonymous and then, you know, more in control of, of the transactions that you put that put out on, on like blockchain. So, uh, yeah, so the big players are always going to do what they do, you know, try, try to be more profitable and then, you know, uh, uh, but you as a user in, in like Web3 have much more control on, on your data. So you can expose the data that you would want to expose. So for instance, always like when, when you uh, enter like, like a venue, which is like age-based, then you have to show them your, your driver's license or some identity yeah. card, right? So they don't need to know like your, your surname or full name, but, when you were born, as a matter of fact, like they just need to know that you're more than 18 years old to, to do something. So yes. the blockchain, the Web3 technology is going to like, just tell them like, you know, uh, just uh, do a query on the blockchain and it says, yes, this person is over 18 years. And that's all that they need to hear and, and let you into, into the venue. So a lot of this control you, you get through like the Web3 technologies, right? So which, won't be available for the big players. So you're only exposing the data that you want to expose. And, and that gives them little power over you, you know, into classifying you into those buckets. So, so I would say it's going to be a challenge for the current like business models. I think if, if the business model sort of changes into, uh, you know, giving you incentive for, for disclosing your information, at least you're getting a, a, a pie of that cake, right? So right now everything is being taken by the big players. Now here you get a, a pie of, of the cake as well. Fantastic, brilliant, brilliant perspective. I think that's really interesting to see. And one, one thing I was keen to ask, I know this is a slightly, it's similar to the question about people entering Web3, but we'd really, be really curious to hear your thoughts on companies who are of course in Web2. How do you see the successful companies going forward making use of Web3, if that makes sense? Because that's a big transition. Like you mentioned, you know, business models and products existing already. What do you think they should do to uh, to make the most of this uh, transition? Sure. So I think I can start with, you know, the basic uh, signing in option that you see right now. Like on, on every website, you have the option to sign in with Facebook, sign in with Google, or sign in with the Apple ID or whatever. So if you can transform that to, you know, sign in with the Web3 service provider. So, so that changes the game completely. Like, you know, people don't, uh, whoever is like, like giving that sort of service doesn't have to know a lot, lot about you through, through like Facebook, Google or, or Apple or whatever. So, uh, so the point I'm trying to make here is people who are mindful, like you always see this in, in Web2 as well. So let's say one messenger application is not encrypting its, its like data. So mm -hmm. you'll have like a competitor coming up saying, see people, these people's, you know, uh, I mean, this app's communication are not secured. Anybody can listen to it. Use our, you know, chat messenger, which is sort mm -hmm. of encrypted. So there is still like good out there, like, you know, good people trying to build like good applications uh, who are trying to improve on, on like what, what what's already happening in, in web two so on and so forth so definitely uh, so this will be a, a distinguishing factor whether you want to give away like everything uh, into the hands of like you know web two players or choose like these players who are giving you the option to own your data you know mm -hmm. own, own the assets for instance if you're playing like games you're into games and then uh, all the assets that you you know uh, earned with your hard uh, hard work of like playing playing the games for so many days. <laughs> so if they are just going to be like seized by by the provider, you know what good it is. So you'll always find these competitors who come with a narrative saying, "So here we're going to use like a Web three service to protect like your data or you know your assets or whatever." Mm -hmm. 
and then you can still enjoy like all the benefits that that the other company is offering so so there's a lot of like scope for integrating like web3 features into mm. like existing apps fantastic and one thing i guess this leads into actually another very good question was uh, yeah i guess it was around picturing web3 in terms of new products and services um I think, well, obviously done a brilliant job, you know, explaining it, you know, blockchain and, and all the principles around it, it's, it's obviously so important. Uh, one of the yeah. was really keen to maybe get an idea of examples. So it might even be a few products that are web free. Uh, so I guess maybe for some people it's easier to uh, imagine. Makes sense. I mean, what for you is maybe one or two really good examples of, of web free products that uh, you can see lots of people using. Uh, even already or in in future. Sure. Uh, so one thing is like decentralized finance. So so basically, Web three is is after like the current financial system and and you know how uh, difficult it is to uh, you know bank the bankless. So mm. talking about like the world population in general, uh, giving an identity card to somebody. And then, you know, having them like get a bank account and et cetera, it, it's a, such a big hurdle. So, so decentralized finance at the core is, is after like the shortcomings of the existing financial, uh, you know, infrastructure that is out there. So uh, personally, I see like, like, you know, DeFi being like one of the main applications of, of like Web3. And then there is this, this talk about like NFTs and, and like the whole concept of metaverse where so right now, if you put all your assets into like a centralized player, you know, they can, they own your data basically. So if you don't want that to happen and sort of like you own like your own data, then I think building the metaverse and assets in, in the metaverse through like Web3 would be, you know, a, a long-term uh, vision that, that people will sort of have. And then there is this cryptocurrencies anyways so, so they have been the use current use case for uh, a decade right now uh, mm -hmm. so they are going to live the whole stable coins thing which sort of you know gives the liquidity lets you like transfer uh, like you know money seamlessly uh, rather than like waiting like three days for you know <laughs> some transaction to go through or, or whatever so yes. yeah so DeFi is is like my biggest stake like this is my opinion um yeah. and i think like nfts are also for creators like nfts are, are like uh, a gift i would say so where you know any place where you you reuse that that nft will have to pay pay you royalty for your work and you're going to set what royalty it is uh, right so so I, I always give this example that i take some pictures beautiful pictures but i upload to stock stock photo providers so nice. they let people download it for ten dollars and they pay me 10 cents right so so i don't need like that that central uh provider to to sort of take away so much i would rather mm. sell it for one dollar and you know uh, have the rest of the profit shared by the decentralized network providers rather than going into their pockets so that's one clear example where the creator wins you know the people who are downloading it wins and everybody wins right so nobody is losing uh, uh in this scenario and, and you're right, you're right about it. that's a great example. And I think what, for me, really draws me even more into Web3, obviously there's many reasons. One of the ones is this story around ownership. To me, that's quite powerful because mm -hmm. I think we all uh, relate to, you know, data, Facebook, all the scandals, this whole idea of monopolies who, yeah, like you said, control our data and information and now it's kind of power to the people. And I think for me, that's, quite inspiring to be honest um one question however which larks has asked which i think is important to cover and interested to hear your perspective is even though it's decentralized you know you still have companies like OpenSea, and is there an argument there that there's still some centralization and does it undermine some progress we're making uh i, I obviously i don't know so yeah we can do so yeah, yeah. So it's it's a very powerful question, and then I keep questioning it like every day that I'm in, in like you know this Web three space. So mm -hmm. when you talk about like decentralization, it is multifaceted, right? So one is is the technology decentralized, meaning like uh, 
are there nodes that are running on like every continent you know if let's say something happens and and somebody disrupts an entire continent will this application still like run you know without any, any sort of like outage so so that's the technological decentralization we're talking about um and a lot of new blockchain projects that you see uh they are secured by stake right so they have their own tokenomics like the tokens and if you if you're talking from the tokenomics perspective you know uh, and the underlying things that are associated with tokenomics right so there is staking and and there is like uh, what do you call it? democracy uh, with which you you, you with the tokens that can be used to to like decide what the network does later on so here we are talking about like political point of like decentralization right so uh, who holds like like the stake largest stake in the network and how much can they control so uh, it's like a multifaceted like a uh, topic and as long as the project is committed to decentralizing further and further mm-hmm. i think that's a that's a really good good indicator of the commitment of i mean it has to start somewhere right so the if the project has to start it should start with a centralized group of people and then mm-hmm. slowly it should it should sort of like decentralize uh, the ultimate decentralization example is like bitcoin where you know the creator just just gave that code and then you know anybody can spin up a node and then run it and and so it's like the ultimate decentralization uh, tech that is out there and then uh, but it comes at a cost as you see like you know it it's not easy to to run that node uh, it's like proof of work and you're trying to tackle those problems with with this economic aspect and with economics uh, the world wasn't created equal before web3 started you know uh, like people own a significantly lot of money who can like like own a lot of like this new web3 mm. stake as well so if the world was created equal then then web3 would have taken off like you know as a as like a universal <laughs> what do you say like all equal kind of like ideology but but yeah unfortunately that's how the economic situation of the world is and then uh as long as the web3 project that you're following is committed to like decentralizing like their their network their technology their tokenomics and and everything i think that's that's something you can um uh, you know count on and and again it ties into like education so i think understanding exactly like which projects are doing that is is the key yeah. mm. absolutely i think that's really interesting that's something that i hope improves like you said you know the starting point in terms of equality for web three is is obviously not not equal, you know, and that's that's really interesting. What's your perspective on yeah, that? Yeah, I think I can I can also advertise about something Web three Foundation does to ensure like decentralization. So from technology point of view, uh, we have what's called thousand validators program. So it's like so Web three Foundation it's giving its like personal stake to these decentralized individual like like uh, players. Like these are not like corporations, so these are like individual. uh people who are who are trying to uh like be part of the decentralized network so i think initiatives like these like show exactly that you know how much a project is committed to to sort of like decentralize it it's like is it like sticking to its vision of of like decentralization or not great that's so no, thank thank you guys that that's, that's fantastic because one thing i was alluding to and i was curious about was i guess it it's it's an accessibility thing Uh, I wonder what you think about this. I know obviously the education part is huge, which you know I really yeah. applaud what you're, you're doing with foundations. So I think for me that's one of the biggest things. How do you see it in terms of accessibility from a tech point of view, in terms of Wi-Fi access, you know, access to computers, phones? Is that something that's relatively equal now worldwide, or are there still kind of gaps that we can we can fill? You know, people maybe don't have access to. strong enough internet or uh, you know laptops and these types of things sure i think web3 sort of solves this by not requiring their you know whatever so talk about like cryptocurrencies or or crypto assets uh, yes. as long as they have a paper paper with their 12 word like mnemonic phrase which i hate <laughs> as long <laughs> as they have it then then their ownership is sort of guaranteed right so you don't need to like interact with the network or or do anything with it 
you can be outside like Wi-Fi or, or you know, uh, disconnected like for the next one year, but still like your mm -hmm. your uh, ownership and your data lives on the blockchain. Like you know, it's it's sort of uh, unadulterated, unaltered like data which is going to be there. Uh, but yeah, so we're talking about a different problem here. Like still, uh, I'm from India, and then I know few you know places in in India around like my city, so they are not like well connected with like internet or or broadband. Or, or other things. So if they have to like really participate in in like the decentralization tech, uh, I think it'll be very challenging given the lag, uh, you know, of of their nodes contacting like the nodes in the Europe, for instance. And and uh, I think the network sort of has these incentive mechanisms to to sort of like give less incentive to somebody who's not contributing very well to the network. So so in that way, like participation. In, in like the actual network is still challenging if you have like uh, you know spotty internet connection, but accessing the services of Web three, I think yeah, that's not a problem uh, in terms of uh, yeah. Fantastic, and a few more questions. Um, first of all, really appreciate your time, right there. Some, some excellent answers and perspectives, and uh, I just think that the story around what you're doing is is so powerful. You know, I'm. I consider myself a, a web free beginner in my many uh, in many ways and you know i think everything you've said to me just really strikes strikes a chord so, so thank you for that first and foremost uh, i've got a few more questions we'll obviously go to the panel shortly um i'm a big fan of some more quick fire questions to kind of wrap up and give some good uh, tips and advice and these these types of things so i guess the first quick fire one would be if you had to pick one project that's not polka dark so that's the big one that uh, obviously excites today if you had to pick one project in 2022 that you're most excited about what would uh, what would that be so you're just putting me on spot here <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see so i can i i think i can talk about like the technology that i'm that i'm very like excited about uh, and that is like DeFi. And I can't pick like a winner or loser here. Like I think every ecosystem that you can point to has like a DeFi aspect to it. And mm -hmm. uh, like I mentioned, I one of my I mean this is like a rapid fire, but I'm gonna take my time. So please, please, to no, be no, very no, honest, no. <laughs> yeah. So to be very honest, like my motivation to like join the Web3 movement was looking at uh, the whole economics, the situation. Uh, the banking and, you know, how much power like the bank financial institutions like wield and mm -hmm. how much they control, you know, me and, and my organization and my country and, and everything. Right. So uh, if you think of it, like uh, every country on the globe is having like a national debt, but who are they owing that debt to? Right. So who has so much of money to to give uh, all these like like countries? So there's something fundamentally um off right there so so that's what made me like dig into like you know what what are the technologies that can address like what's going on and i feel like like web3 uh is really really handling that and and then defi is, is what i would pick as as a uh something that that uh you know mm. as my favorite for for this year today i'm gonna actually hop back to a question from the audience I had a really good one just come in uh at the the, the clip yep. fire was i think you mentioned a, a bit of this i'm interested maybe to expand on it for for this audience member sabrina so she was asking that about web3 and do you think this will call for more cross-pollination between platforms uh, i guess that could be many things that could be companies but Ab uh, what do you think absolutely like i think so being like a developer who's entering Web3, don't think of like creating your own siloed like blockchain. Uh, think of like uh, composability, right? So that's one of the main features of Web3. You can compose on top of like what is already out there and try to like incorporate as many things that are out there as possible. So, so this kind of cross-pollination is what drives like development in Web3. Um, yeah, so that's a really good question. And I, I also saw one more question, which is, what happens to users' identity credentials if they die? Yes, yes. <laughs> unless you handed over your your 12, 12 word mnemonic phrase to someone, or you put that in a locker, 
with like a will saying, you know, so and so person is going to access that locker with with <laughs> with that twelve word mnemonic phrase. Yeah, unfortunately, right now, like there's no no other way to transfer like the assets. It's, it's fascinating, isn't it? And coming back to that one, I know you mentioned a few kind of projects working on that. In, I guess in terms of security as well. I mean, what what do you think might be a better approach? Because yeah, it does seem. Uh, most secure or something you yeah. and then obviously like you mentioned no one else has it how do you do it i mean do you think there's alternatives it's yeah so person. yeah yeah i mean like i mentioned uh, i mean first of all like i said I, i'm not a big fan of like this mnemonic phrase based you know everything linked to that uh, there's a chance of like losing a lot of like uh, assets you know if you lose that phrase but in any case like i can talk about like substrate and polkadot like how they are trying to like solve this issue. So there mm. is uh, what is called a palette. So palettes are something any blockchain pro project can like import and use on their like blockchains. So there's a social recovery palette. So what you could do is with your account, you could pick uh, a bunch of accounts like your friends or like your, your relatives or, or you know your family. Uh, so people don't have to expose like their, their identity, but still they are like accounts on the blockchain. So you could like uh, do a social recovery, uh, you know, mechanism by by pointing to their accounts. So let's say something happens, and then and then uh, how do you transfer that uh, you know account ownership to others? So that can also be like cryptographically like so solved. But again, you're adding a layer of complexity on top of like you know the existing complexity, and that's where like again like education comes in. Like people have to really understand and know like what the social recovery like palette is and how to use it and how to like claim uh, you know the ownership of of those accounts. So so people are are one thing I can tell you you know in my eight months I've seen like brilliant minds like working on solving these problems with math, right? So math is so objective. You don't need like like you know any sort of subjective opinions here. Mm. So purely cri cryptographically, they're trying to ensure like all of these are fail safe and then they work in in sort of any conditions on on any any computer on 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 the planet so uh, but yeah so all of this needs to uh, be shown to the outside world and people have to understand that and appreciate for for what what that technology is and and use it fantastic brilliant i much until quarter past so i spend a bit more time on Maybe a couple of quick fire ones um, to, to get bookends. What, what's been a really brilliant chat. Um, so thank you again. I was wondering, I mean, obviously you've got the Web3 Foundation yourself, you know, very kind of great source of information and uh, and knowledge first and foremost. Is there anyone you'd, you'd recommend people follow on Twitter or LinkedIn or newsletters kind of from a broader Web3 point of view? You know, if it's like project opportunities, maybe job openings. Is there anything that you follow that you find particularly helpful? Um, so I can actually like provide, uh, so it's a big list. So uh, oh, I'll probably like provide it to you, which you can like share like later on, uh, but, but yeah. <laughs> that's it, and I'm pretty on the spot now. So <laughs> that's great, no, if, if that's good, that'd be fantastic. That'd be really very much appreciated. One thing, this is more of like a technical thing that I'd love to learn personally. This is about Ethereum um, and actually Ethereum 2.0, right? What's, mm -hmm. what's yeah. the difference? So that's something that strikes me as quite a big change or quite a big development. Uh, yeah, wonder if you'd be able to explain it. I'm really curious about it. Sure. So, so right now, Ethereum blockchain, it uses proof of work, just like Bitcoin, uh, you know, so the, so the miners sort of spend some, some computation power in solving few, few puzzles. And then after successfully solving one, they create like a block, et cetera. So Ethereum two is sort of changing to, uh, rather than like, you know, wasting these computational resources, Ethereum two is like using the economics aspect of it. So here you can, Put your Ethereum at stake uh, for validations, and and it's pretty much like what uh, uh, all, all the new like you know blockchains that that you've seen that use staking do, right? So Ethereum, uh, 
you know, the significant developer community in Ethereum identifies this to be like a more green alternative to keep, you know, uh -huh. Ethereum blockchain like uh, sustainable uh, over like time and then being able to, you know, better address like the governance aspect of like Ethereum. So, so now Ethereum has to like do hard forks, like when some people don't agree on, on, on certain aspect, like you've seen that happen when the DAO, uh, you know, thing happened. So mm -hmm. Ethereum split into like two, two blockchains and then, uh, yeah, so th there are like significant, uh, improvements that, that you're going to see, uh, in, in Ethereum 2.0. So which is going to address, uh, the limitations of, of the actual one. And, and I can tell you that it's not going to be an easy switch because mm -hmm. Ethereum comes with, with like its own incentives. You have built an ecosystem around that, the mining and, and miners, et cetera, who eventually have a say in, you know, whether we want to upgrade to, to Ethereum 2.0 or not. So, so it's interesting to see like how the transition is going to happen. It's really fascinating, isn't it? And, and coming back to that point for the miners and, you know, decentralization, people having a say. So, and yeah, excuse my complete lack of uh, you know, knowledge about what, what's happening with it. So this is a change that's already happening or do people are people able to to say no and stay with ethereum 1.0 uh, we we don't know that yet so right now there, there is a, a a chain uh you know uh that is being like developed uh i think the timeline as i recollected it there are still like years to for this to like come to fruition so oh, okay. uh so oh. it's like a long-term game uh given like I think one one of the questions earlier was was also about like Ethereum and and why there are so many developers in in Ethereum because yeah. it was the only blockchain that let you like develop something, you know, from from yeah. 2017. So obviously, uh, there, there's a lot of development uh, uh, on on Ethereum, and then um, yeah, so uh, we should see like how this this is going to like transform uh, in the longer run, right? So people would want to stay like where they are and and still like like you know uh do what they're doing and right now i think the biggest uh contenders for for that are the ones saying if you have a project on ethereum you can simply port it to our black blockchain you'll have the same quality of service but you're going to pay like uh you know less gas fee here so so anybody with with that sort of narrative is sort of attractingly like these projects that uh want to like, you know, move away from, from it. But, but again, like, you know, Ethereum trying to like upgrade to 2.0, uh, is probably going to keep them like where they are. That's it. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. The, the cast one, I mean, I, this is a personal thing. I only won NFT. I've started getting into it and obviously very, very low price. And the gasping I do remember is something that I never knew and it was surprising. And it's something that strikes me maybe as a big, uh, pain point for, for some people so that's really so you have the whole panel next who are going to talk about like nfts i know uh, so, good, good uh, thing and i won't, won't bring it in just now obviously in, in terms of topic yeah. mm -hmm. um fantastic i'm just seeing there's a couple of other interesting questions um you might see radio just one in the general chat around um convergence and divergence um i'm wondering what they mean by the question you might <laughs> not sure if you you might know about that one so they've asked convergence and divergence about the web free transition. Um, interesting question. I'm not sure, 100% sure what they mean. So we'll go on to another one or two just to kind of to, to finish up. One thing I was keen to ask on the topic of events actually is um, if there's any that you're attending around here or any events that you tend to, to go to, virtual or, or in person uh, around web free. Well, me personally, like yeah. I. I can, I mean, so I have my Twitter profile too. I, I follow like a bunch of like accounts. I think for me, uh, Messari, um, you know, so they have uh, like like a good in-depth like research analysis of, of what's happening, uh, the block. And so there are a, a bit of like these these services that sort of compile like what, what's happening day to day in, in like Web3 uh, that I tend to follow. And a and lot of it, again, it, it's... Uh, so you venture out and then you see like what's making sense to you, right? So you don't, uh, the whole thing about like Web3 is like, you know, you make your own judgment. So so a lot of my Twitter following list was compiled that way. As as long as like I can 
you know, I, I read through like what they're tweeting and then that makes sense to me if I like dig deeper into it rather than like blindly, like, you know, following like what they're saying. So I think you, you build like your own like curated list that sort of like helps you. But yeah, so personally I felt uh, like Messari uh, was, was one source where I could get like answers to my questions. Fantastic. Brilliant. So close to time, buddy, one more final question and then um, obviously leave me back, back to Dave. But first of all, huge thank you from me and uh, from everyone. Um, so great to, to have your perspective and once again, really, really applaud what you're doing. You know, the education is is, is key and uh, you might see in some of started growing channels and websites. That's one of the things that we say we do, first of all. You know, for us, it's educating, connecting, inspiring, but educating in my mind comes first so, so that's, that's brilliant um so if I asked a similar question but this might be a nice one maybe to kind of give our perspective looking forwards um so let's say we're, we're speaking this time next year 2023 what what do you see as maybe one or two of the key trends in web3 this year um what do you think will, will, will become even more significant yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the panel next is going to like give you a good roadmap for that. So I feel like the whole uh, ownership thing uh, on on like internet is going to take off. So right now, like there's a lot of spotlight on like NFTs, right? So so people know those three letters like NFT, but but they can't even like, you know, uh, say like what they stand for, but still like they, they are so hyped up about, about that. So I think over like, the next, so like I said, DeFi is my pick for this year, but mm -hmm. next year I, I uh, am really hopeful that the ownership on, on like Web3 takes off and people actually understand that the true uh, value addition like NFTs are going to like bring uh, to everybody's lives. So yeah, so DeFi for this year, NFTs for the next year is my pick. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, hey, that's two things we'll absolutely work out for. Very well. Thanks again, man. Really, once again, really appreciate your time. Um, I'm sure the audience will agree with me. I learned a huge amount. I'm sure they did did too. And um, like we said, we'll, we'll obviously share the link already for Web3 Foundation. Uh, anything else that you'd be keen to, to share with the audience uh, later after the event, we'll, we'll make sure we do as well. And if it's okay, we'll maybe share your Twitter page for people to follow. If, uh, if I will, okay. I will definitely. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Brilliant. Um, well, thanks a lot, Sadie. Um, I'll stay on. I think, Radhi, you've got a button for broadcast. So if you press that again, that will should bring you back to, to backstage. I'll come and join you in a second anyway. And we'll, we'll hand over to the panel. Um, I'll stay on just for a second, just to make sure everyone's all good. I'm sure they are, though. And then uh, I'll let Katie uh, introduce the panel. Over to you, Katie, I guess, if you're, if you're ready. Thanks so much, Declan. That was absolutely great. Um, hello, everybody. My name's Katie. I'm from Startup Grind, Isle of Man. It's great. To see so many of you with us today. And um, thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, I'm really looking forward to this panel. We've got some great speakers and it's a really great opportunity to learn some new things. So I will introduce you to the panel. The topic is the metaverse, NFTs, and sustainability in Web3. For anyone that would like to ask questions throughout the event, please do post your um, questions in the chat or in the Q&A tab. Today we have with us Irina. Irina Kiriger is the head of metaverse growth at Unique Network, where she leads the business growth activities for the organization. She restlessly works to empower creators and artists to recognize the value of NFTs by providing them with the most advanced tools available. She's a Polkadot head ambassador for Western Europe and also London's regional co-chair of the Foundation for International Blockchain and Real Estate Expertise. Irina is the co-founder of Design B2C, a UK crypto fintech boutique consulting firm that focuses on DeFi, Web3 services, NFTs and real estate tokenization. We also have with us today Bruno Skorvark, founder of RMR Cap. Bruno has previously worked on Ethereum 2.0 and Polkadot. Kusama leads the team behind rmrk.app and the, the most advanced NFT protocol in the world. We also have Alexander Ganson. Alexander is the startup founder and mentor and co-founder of Supplane and WOF Labs. 
He's digitizing supply chains. He's a blockchain evangelist and NFT collector, lecturer at Taltech, part, partner and lead mentor at the Nordic Startup School and lead mentor at Technical Startup Incubator. And Stefan Kovac is a, is a senior commercial executive with a passion for disruptive digital businesses. Stefan has over 20 years of experience in the travel, entertainment and gaming sectors, having held senior roles in a number of high growth companies, including Virgin Atlantic, Apodo, PokerStars, BWIN and Funfet Technologies. Stefan is the CEO and founder of Rare Things, a Web3 advisory business helping sports entities, celebrities and brands understand, enter and navigate the world of NFTs, tokens and metaverses. So great lineup. And I'm also delighted to introduce you to Denise Matthews, who is our fantastic Startup Grind director from Gibraltar, who will be moderating the event for you today. Thanks very much. And over to you, Denise. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was a great introduction. I think we know a little bit about our panelists. So, welcome. I'm going to jump now. Um, I think after having that great fireside chat with Dr. Rada from Web3 Foundation, please tell us a little bit about uh, the aims of Web3, the metaverse, and your role with Unique Network, Irina. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be on today's panel. Uh, so Web3, as you know, uh, as many people who have been building Web3 for years uh, were actually quite surprised uh, with Facebook's announcement of changing its uh, mission and vision to Meta. And now there is a lot of debate in the space. You know, what is the real metaverse, how it should be managed and um, what are the benefits? And of course, in Web3, we all are advocating for decentralization community management, um, DAOs now are on the rise uh, to support uh, governance. So really and truly the metaverse, uh, it, it's a combination of different things. And for me, metaverse does not exist without Web3 economy um, because we've seen cases like Second Life, um, The Sims, I don't know, any game you, you can name, uh, that is just a game unless you provide an infrastructure for Web3 economy and token economy um, that enables uh, communication of these different virtual worlds and actually exchange of goods and trading of digital assets. So uh, the bottom line is, of course, uh, economic layer, but in terms of collaboration and visual appearance, uh, of course, at the moment, um, it, it's difficult to talk about decentralization of visual services because you would need, you know, there could be DAO of creators, but at the same time, uh, you need other companies of that create virtual reality, uh, that create front end solutions, UX and UI designers to work uh, all together to enable a friendlier user interface and better graphic um, representation of the metaverse because there's now this challenge uh, of creators who really go for high quality rendering and they put, you know, uh, a lot of effort and work into uh, making every little detail as, as realistic and as uh, beautiful as possible. So then they want to actually create gaming experiences and virtual world experiences uh, at the same level of quality. So this, I think, is uh, one of the challenges we're still facing because the current metaverses, they still lack that level of um, visual representation. And this is where I think uh, we're going to put a lot of effort in 2022. There will be many more creators designers, architects, discovering uh, what Metaverse is and how to uh, basically move their business and move their creativity to this world to reach out to more people and to actually get paid for their efforts in a different manner using uh, using token economy and cryptocurrencies. So this is, yeah, it's, it's really in a nutshell, <laughs> very <laughs> kind of... Uh, uh summarized uh, idea of what the metaverse is but is actually a combination of the virtual world of e-commerce of uh different creative industries reinforcement of creating community creative community uh, and a combination and power of web3 economy 
Nina, that's great. We're going to talk a lot about the play to earn model and the new ways of gaming and NFTs a little bit later on. And I have a ton of questions for you, but I'm just going to remind the attendees that you can drop your direct questions to the panel in our Q&A box, and we will try and get to as many of those as possible. So I'm going to jump over to Sandra and um, take yourself off mute. Then I will ask you, since you're sitting in a startup incubator in Estonia, I believe, um, which is actually a, a startup capital in itself. Why do you think Silicon Valley, big tech and VCs are obsessed with Web3? Well, yeah, indeed. I'm in Estonia and uh, I'm actually uh, literally two minutes from uh, Russian border. <laughs> So uh, why? Um, uh, it's a hype, definitely. And uh, I pretty much believe that uh, uh, this obsession in Europe is uh, a FOMO, but uh, in uh, San Francisco, I see that people more and more actually understand what is behind the technology. Uh, we have been uh, talking with uh, uh, several of our community members uh, in the States who are uh, have been who have been investing in uh, World of Freight, and the majority of those guys are actually uh, very well informed about uh, what uh, uh, Raza Krishna was uh, speaking about. Uh, but as uh, uh, long as we meet with uh, guys from London or Berlin, uh, uh, for them uh, Web three is pure buzzword. Okay, well, um, I think Bruno, I'm going to ask you next to tell us a little bit about RMRK 2.0 and the vision. So you aim to be a next generation NFT system in the world. Why don't you talk to us? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so we, we are like remark uh, was created out of frustration with the current NFT marketplace and the NFT space in general, where it's all just expensive links to expensive images. And um, I wanted to do more with NFTs because they can and should do more, especially with regard to the metaverse. Um, almost every metaverse out there right now is just a multiplayer game. Uh, they just replaced usernames and passwords with you either having or not having an NFT in your wallet, and that's it. Uh, you don't actually use the NFT in the game ever. Mm. And um, what what you do when you use an NFT in, a, in the metaverse is the team that built the game is actually building a custom client, a custom model of that uh, NFT in the client itself. And then the software checks, does this user have this NFT in the wallet? If so, then allow them access to this model. This is not the metaverse. This is not Web3. This is nothing. Um, uh, additionally, you can log into many different things with that same NFT while you're log in, logged into another, and you can also sell that NFT while you're logged into the game that required that NFT to log in. Um, so this is kind of like a, a farce right now and, and just, you know, jumping on a bandwagon. Um, and, and so Remark also kind of solves that issue. And we do this with five elementary NFT Legos for the NFT 2.0 movement, which allow everything that's been possible with NFT so far, but also take it a few generations beyond anything that's been possible so far. So our NFTs can own other NFTs. Our NFTs can have multiple resources so that you have um, contextual output of an NFT depending on what environment you look at it in. For example, if you have like a, um, let's say you have a photorealistic game with realistic graphics, and then you have a cartoonish game with cartoonish graphics. Let's say you buy an NFT jacket for your NFT avatar. Now, because our NFTs are nestable and can equip each other, this is already compatible. So the avatar can wear the jacket. But in one environment, your avatar is photorealistic, and in the other one, it's cartoonish. And so if you buy the jacket, which one, which version do you get? The cartoonish or the realistic one? Well, with multi-resource NFTs, one NFT can have two different outputs or more different outputs, depending on the context. And so you get a realistic one for your realistic experience and the cartoonish one for a cartoonish one. But it's applicable to, to a lot more. Like you have an ebook that can at the same time be a PDF file, an audio file, and a cover image. And these are different resources of the same NFT. So if you load that NFT into Audible, it'll just play. If you load it into Singular, our marketplace, it'll just be able to you know, be readable as a PDF. And if you load it into OpenSea, you'll just see the cover because they don't support either audio books or, or uh, PDFs. Um, 
And so there's a couple more Legos in there, like being able to issue emotes, like emotional reactions to people's NFTs on chain. And then there's also the conditional rendering Lego, which will let your NFT react to those emotes. So, you know, you have a, a picture of a Mona Lisa, you send 50 kissy emojis to it, and then the Mona Lisa blushes. Um, and then we also have the ability to, to split the NFTs into, into tokens, uh, but not for gambling, like right now on Ethereum. Instead, you use these tokens to collectively govern the NFT because the NFT can do so much more. Now the community that owns these tokens can actually tell the NFT, hey, NFT, equip this item in this slot and then do this and this and this. And so the community can collectively interact with it. So you can imagine this as a, as a, like a Twitch streamer having a, an NFT avatar and going into a game session, but his audience has the tokens of this NFT avatar. And now the audience can use these tokens to decide what the avatar is going to wear for this quest and how successful that's going to be. So you now have a collective collaborative gaming experience and you can put these Legos together in any combination. And when you put them into any of these permutations and combinations, you actually can end up with a, you know, any kind of NFT operating system of any arbitrary complexity. Um, so this is why we're aggressively moving away from the just art as NFTs, even though it's the, the clearest way to explain it to, you know, non-technical people. But we kind of want them to think about NFTs as rows of data that you can prove that you own cryptographically mm -hmm. and then think what you can store in those rows of data. So that, that's basically it. Perfect. Sounds really exciting. And I'm very glad to see that you all this is a super exciting panel. As I said, I'm going to try and ask you as many things as possible. I'm going to go to Stefan now because your background is in the gaming industry um, and it's evolving rapidly towards using blockchain, Web3. Obviously, we're hearing a lot about the play as well. So you've been at the forefront of blockchain within the gaming industry. And I saw you nodding um, very positively towards lots of the things that were said, except the part where when you speak to people in London, because I know that... <laughs> I took and, I took minor minor and offense to that, but uh, <laughs> not just that you have a really cool project. So why don't you tell us about um, web rare, rarer things and being an independent Web three advisory service? Uh, what's going on? What's going on? Yeah. So uh, as you said, I, I kind of my background is is predominantly in kind of gaming and gambling. Actually, I started with internet startups in the late '90s, and this is very reminiscent for me of that period, kind of mid to late '90s with the internet. It's very early days, I would say, in terms of of, of Web three. And about five years ago, uh, I was I, I left my kind of poker job uh, at the time. I was working for a company called Poker Stars. And I got involved with a first generation Ethereum DAP called Funfair Technologies. I uh, became the CEO of that business, worked there for about three years. And it, this was before the hype. Uh, so this was you know, the first kind of crypto uh, bull run that happened in 2017. And then we entered the, the kind of uh, the ominous sounding as it was crypto winter for kind of three years. And it was hard work. You had to there wasn't the audience that you've got now, even though the audience is still pretty small, there wasn't the infrastructure. Uh, and frankly, a lot of the startups in the space were building things which didn't have a compelling or strong enough use case. I'd argue that with, with Funfair. I left there about a year, just over a year ago, um, and I've set up an advisory, a Web3 advisory. Um, and I don't think anyone's an expert in the space. I don't claim to be an expert in the space, it's too young. Um, but you know, I have got some, some knowledge, some background in the space. My background kind of prior to this was marketing. I see a lot of this is kind of being product and marketing based. And I provide an agnostic service, uh, mainly to web two, but also to web three businesses. I'm not tied to a token. I'm not tied to a blockchain. I'm not tied to a product. I hopefully provide value in terms of, you know, why is it that you should be entering web three? Should you be entering web three? question and if so why and then doing a tech audit and also a vendor audit to help uh, execute so one of the areas I'm focusing in on because of my past is gaming um, and gambling and as you say there is uh, it's one of the kind of key industries I think that are being immediately impacted by blockchain and web3 and 
you know, the metaverse is very interesting. It's interesting what Irina was saying. Gaming, you know, and the generations below us, the millennials and Gen Zs, are used to being in these 3D environments. They spend an enormous amount of time in them, even though they're Web 2. So it's going to be natural for them to move into a Web 3 metaverse where they can actually own items. And gaming is very much at the forefront of that. So Sandbox is a good example of a gaming um, metaverse. And really what's happening within gaming is where people spend an enormous amount of time, an enormous amount of skill to progress in a game and earn uh, different items, whether that's swords, power-ups, statuses, whatever it might be, but they don't own it. That's currently being owned by, it's on a centralized server, it's with a game development company. They don't own it, okay? And what Web3 does is it enables ownership within the game. So you can own the land, you can own your character, you can own a sword, you can own a gun, you can own all sorts of different things. And because you own it, you can sell it and you can make money. But you can go beyond that. And within games, you can create economies and you can create passive income streams, which actually mean that as a gamer, the effort I put in is being rewarded and I see the benefit through a financial means, through a cryptocurrency or an NFT, rather than it just going to a central game development um, company or, or, or startup. And the other big movement that I think we'll see much more of this year is DAOs. So actually, again, within gaming, gamers controlling the destiny of the game. So if they own part of the game, they're earning money out of the game, what's the next logical step? Well, actually, I want to say in how this game develops, right, how we move this forward, and it becomes community driven. Um, so yeah, that's my <laughs> Thank summary. You. Well, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Um, I think it's interesting to see that there are, there's so much um, going on in the space. And obviously, the tech is, is moving at a pace that none of us can keep um can keep up with i'm going to come back to Irina because i know that you are an architect by profession but then you got totally sucked in by uh this new way of being able to build things which is very interesting to me so as head ambassador for polkadot so involved in kusama and, and so many other hats that you wear um can you explain uh, a little bit more about polkadot the parachain the scalability and the interoperability Sure, Dennis, even though I think that Bruno will be the best person to explain this as the uh, <laughs> uh, his past experiences in education Web3, but in principle, Kusama is the canary network of Polkadot, uh, and now it gained a lot of independence and has its own very loyal community, and there are a lot of projects being built there, like Moonsama, and there's a metaverse there, um, and it's really, Kusama what actually attracted me to the ecosystem by the token, by the ideology, by the um sort of the the look and feel and because you know it's uh the network is named after yoko kusama's works the dots and the whole you know the whole concept behind it is uh, is something that i find uh personally very appealing uh kusama as as substrate um framework in general uh, allows for a lot of experimentation with the code it's very flexible it's very uh up upgradable, scalable, uh, and interoperable. And this is the reason why a lot of projects actually decide to stay on Kusama and build their technical blockchain solution on Kusama. Uh, and Polkadot is more what we call, uh, you know, sort of enterprise level um, solution for parachains. Uh, but all of them, the idea is for parachains in the ecosystem to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, and actually, just a couple of days back, Gavin Wood um, uh, published the new XSM solution for NFTs to be able to communicate in the ecosystem. Uh, and this is very exciting milestone for all of us because what, what every project is building an NFT, uh, any NFT out there, uh, we should be able to transfer them from one parachain to another parachain uh, for the simple reason that Web3 uh, is here to replace the Web2, the normal internet as we know it, and trans transform it into the internet of value. So uh, we need to be interconnected. And parachains, the, the whole idea behind Polkadot is for the blockchains to, to be able to talk 
to each other, right? To uh, to so we are all able to transfer this uh, data across blockchains. Uh, there are multiple ways uh, how to get involved. There is funding available via treasuries. Uh, there are actually a lot of initiatives in the treasury. It's all open. Um, you can, anybody can submit proposal for funding and um, funding not only for the technical solution, but also if you say have you know branding ideas or uh, front end ideas or anything that helps community. Uh, grow, advance, and develop uh, can be considered by the council and can be supported by the community. And um, this is also the beautiful part of the Web3, the community uh, and ambassador programs. Uh, of it, it, it is a general um, Polkadot ambassador program where many people um, begin their journey into Polkadot ecosystem uh, as it is a great space and place to connect with other uh, people passionate about uh, Web3 and Polkadot. And there is a Discord channel where we all uh, can exchange ideas. And uh, this is a, a space to meet project founders, um, parachain teams, uh, and uh, Web3 Foundation as well as parity team members. So it's a, it's a great environment of innovation um, exchange of ideas and a lot of support for each other's work. Thank you so much, um, Irina. I've been following you for a very long time. Um, we have a friend in common that I've also interviewed in Startup Grand Gibraltar, Anya Bin. Um, he promotes you a lot, so I saw that you have a podcast with him, so I've been following your work, um, and I think it's absolutely amazing. Also, to have a woman in this space that is such an advocate is, is also great, so well done. Um, I'm going to come over to Bruno, since uh, you mentioned him, because I know that he is working also on Kusuma and Kusama, sorry, and also the, the gas issues on Ethereum. How does RMRK expand on Board 8 Yacht Club NFT, for example, or gas issues? Um, and how does Kusama come into all of this? And why did you choose that chain uh, before any other of the interoperable ones? Um, well, I, I chose Kusama purely because I was deep in Kusama at that point. Mm -hmm. If I had been anywhere else, I would have launched it anywhere else, uh, frankly. but. I was attracted to Kusama cypherpunk culture. It very much felt like the old school Usenet uh, era of, of blockchain where we were, um, you know, like hacking on things and it's, it's very hack friendly. You don't have to be very careful with what you do there. And so Remark actually launched as a hack on Kusama because Kusama doesn't actually have smart contracts to launch NFTs. So we actually hacked all of this onto the chain by force. Um, which was a really fun challenge and experiment. And this was also part of it. In terms of gas costs, I don't think it's very healthy to focus on this. Um, this is this is just um, a, a, a misaligned talking point, much like, I don't know, environmental impact of, of NFTs. None of this is actually real. Uh, just like the gas cost problem is not going to be real in, in a very, very short uh, time. Um, like when Ethereum scales, and it's due to scale a lot this year, so in June, around June 23rd, um, already there's going to be a massive scaling upgrade, and then later on there's going to be more. Uh, these are not going to be active problems. Um, and you can't really look at these problems as something, you know, on which to hedge your unique selling point. And so we don't really, despite the fact that, like, it, it takes you, you, you can mint a few hundred NFTs for $5 on Kusama. We don't really use that as a talking point because soon enough, other chains will catch up to this. Uh, some already do. And it's not really something that you tout as an advantage. What you want is to have something that others cannot have. And what they cannot have is the functionality that we've offered. Mm -hmm. So the, the complexity there is far beyond anything that exists. And this is why it is special. It is not special because it's cheaper. It is not special because it's, it's you know, anything like that, carbon neutral or whatever. Um, it is special because of this functionality and it is special because of this interoperability. By using the remark standard for, you know, cross chain and cross collection equipables, 
uh, whether or not those, like whether those equipables are a, a part of a music track or a jacket for your avatar, it doesn't matter. By using this, not only are you making your NFT collection compatible with any future collection that might come out that you're not even aware of yet, you're also, by launching on Kusama uh, or by extension on Polkadot, you're also immediately connected to all the other chains that are already connected to that chain and will be connected in the future. But the magic here is that unlike in other ecosystems, every one of these chains that connects here is very uh, focused on some specific things. And so you have these chains that are focusing on one context, like just a chain for prediction markets, just a chain for DAOs, just a chain for smart contracts and so on. And when you have this, you can uh, take advantage of this specialization, but still keep communication between them. And so if I use, um, let's say that I participate in a lot of the on-chain governance to upgrade Kusama or Polkadot, and I get NFTs as rewards for this. And then my NFTs, which can be, for example, you can imagine uh, an NFT that is a trophy case, and I earn trophies inside of that case for all of my on-chain actions. Now, this seems like just gamification of governance, which is cool, but also it is automatically implied building of your on-chain reputation. So you are building your on-chain reputation with achievements that are forever yours. Not only that, you can now, because you're connected to all of these other chains, use that reputation. So you can now take that address on which you have earned this reputation, use it in a DeFi focused chain like Karura to get an under collateralized loan at better rates than somebody who's completely unknown and did not participate in the chain at all. And so you have all of these extensions that can now apply on top of this technology rather than just collecting a board ape and letting it sit and gather digital dust in your wallet. So that is the unique selling point there. Well, so Alexander, I'm going to come back to you because you entered the space um, very recently. So back in April, but I think your family and by extension, uh, your even your, your um, sons, wives are involved in, in your new projects and great entrepreneurs. So tell me a little bit about uh, Wolf and Suclaim. How are they going? Yes, uh, indeed, that's uh, kind of a family project for us. Uh, uh, we started in uh, 2014 uh, with a company called uh, Shipitwise. And uh, the goal was uh, to uh, build, well, ideal perfect tool for supply chain, uh, which wasn't really possible at that moment. Uh, so we pivoted a couple of times, uh, exited later to another Web2 company and uh, uh, early February, I think, uh, last year, uh, we started uh, playing with uh, Web2 ideas, uh, Web3 ideas, uh, uh, because uh, one of the issues uh, in the supply chain, uh, uh, the reason why we had to pivot uh, was the combination of uh, private and public data. For traditional uh, shipping company, uh, the pricing data is the biggest secret. Uh, they are not really ready to share it with the world and uh, we need somehow to uh, protect the part of the data. Uh, this was the moment uh, of truth, uh, so we decided that it will be built on Web3, uh, but uh, just recently we decided that it will be uh, the fork of Polkadot. However, uh, for initial funding, uh, uh, we were looking uh, around uh, the local ecosystem and uh, then decided to launch our own uh, NFT project with uh, World of Freight. So we launched World of Freight in early September. And the goal of uh, uh, this action was uh, to build a community uh, around the idea, uh, a community of people who will help to think through uh, all the processes and all the tech side, uh, but also introduce us uh, to the bigger players uh, like uh, Alibaba or Amazon or uh, all those huge ones, and it really happened. Uh, so today uh, there are about uh, 1,500 people in uh, World of Freight community, from uh, which uh, about 600 are our active community members uh, working with us uh, on a weekly basis and some of them on daily basis. Uh, and uh, we uh, sort of uh, uh, 
uh, finance uh, the development of uh, supply in uh, blockchain protocol uh, by uh, selling the both uh, NFTs and uh, building the uh, racing game on top of that, uh, just uh, to spend some cool time with our uh, community members. And uh, last week we also launched, uh, uh, started to build our uh, next racing game uh, on top of uh, NFT worlds. So good time. Congrats. I think one of the really um, key here is community. And I, for one person, because uh, in Gibraltar, we talk about crypto, blockchain and DLT since uh 2017 we have a lot of regulated companies that sit here so i was super excited when they said we were having web three month um something that i've been really looking forward to because our community has uh two million people all over the world i think joining those two concepts together uh the crypto and um nft community and and now startup brand is exciting time for us all. So Stefan, I'm going to ask you to explain what is an NFT um, and what are the use cases and commercialization opportunities from your perspective as uh, an advisory company? Sure thing. Yeah, good question. Question that is uh, asked a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think one of the other panel members, I think it was Bruno, said most people think of it as a piece of art um and a digital piece of art and then the next question is well I, I can't hang it on my wall what's the value in it and you know art is a use case and i think it, it it is proving to be disruptive within that industry but it's 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 the most obvious right but there's far far more to it i think at its simplest you know an nft is it's really a digital certificate it's a digital certificate that can be assigned to anything physical or digital that enables you to prove the provenance of that item it enables you to see all of the previous owners of that item it enables proof to everybody that you own that item okay because it's on a public ledger and because of all of that you're able to sell that item okay and why is that so revolutionary i think if you look at you know cryptocurrencies and and you know the the fungible side of you know blockchains and and cryptocurrencies is revolutionary because we can send money without any middle people being involved at all hence you know money going to the ukrainian government at the moment from the community directly from a wallet directly to another wallet there's no interference there's no middle people whatsoever all of a sudden when you can take an item and let's say i've got a picasso i wish uh but i've got it on my wall i've got that okay and i can go and sell that but actually it's quite difficult to sell it because i'm not going to be able to do it myself i have an nft that represents a digital item and all of a sudden because of the blockchain technology uh proving that i do own it then i can sell it to anybody on the planet okay so i think you know that's the the beauty for me of what nfts bring and it is i think truly revolutionary how it can be used is way beyond art and i think we're only just beginning to discover some of the potential for its use um i would say you know in terms of working with clients what i always ask is you know what is what are your objectives what are you trying to achieve um you know what are the pain points that you're trying to overcome what are the opportunities that you're looking to kind of explore and explode and from that work out is web3 the right technology for you and is the company willing to actually take the steps necessary maybe not the first step because this is you know there's a multi-year strategy to get to kind of a north star in terms of where they want to go to but you know are they willing to seed kind of control because this is ultimately about decentralization it is about putting power back into communities hands um and that's quite uncomfortable i think for a lot of organizations um so baby steps in terms of getting there but some examples i worked on the australian open um in january and the the ceo for the, the australian open was you know we want to be first out of the grand slams to be deploying web3 
and we built uh, Melbourne Park in Decentraland, one of the big open metaverses. Uh, we recreated about three quarters of the grounds and the Australian Open has DJs and barbecues and a beach house and all sorts of different things that you can go and explore. We fed in games um, so you could watch games in there. You could earn uh, POAPs, proof of attendance protocol. So we had parties with DJs and you could prove you were there because you had your little POAP badge. We had wearables as NFTs. We had all sorts of stuff going on and it was very experimental. Um, it's a long way to go, but in my mind, there's no question sports will have a physical ticket as they do today and a virtual ticket for anybody on the planet to attend that event. Okay, and this was done in Decentraland. Decentraland is a, is a web-based um, metaverse, but sure enough, it will be virtual reality, you know, before you know it. Um, so that's an example, I think, of, you know, NFTs and metaverse is coming into play in a very mainstream um, sporting event. But it could be, you know, there's all sorts of different, uh, I guess, executions and, and use cases depending on the industry. It's true. I mean, I work very closely with a company who's building a um, blog bots, which are these little uh, robots you will, be, you will be able to buy and and go on different adventures with um, in the metaverse. And they came on our event in January. We actually live streamed into Crypto Voxels. So just as we were sitting here, we also live streamed to their HQ. Um, sure. And it was kind of a little experiment that we did. We didn't even know that it was possible, but there are so many abilities. I think we're still discovering everything that, that's possible to do with Web3. So um, also talking about the issue of sustainability, I think Web3 provides an opportunity for everybody to be equal and uh, provides opportunities for a more um, sustainable way of working on the internet. So Irina, I'm going to come back to you because you've represented Unique Network and the NFT community at COP26, uh, which I thought was in, truly incredible and also you participate in digital art for climate uh, sharing projects and ideas for the use of clean carbon efficient technologies to support imminent environmental challenges so tell us a little bit about um, thank you for this question, Dennis. Uh, Digital Art for Climate is actually a very important initiative on the global level. Uh, mm -hmm. So the founder, Miroslav Polzer, has been into the climate um, uh, community for quite some time. He is the leader of youth, uh, youth movement that support climate action. Uh, and uh, he's actually in number... 34 now in the top um, top list of uh, Coin Telegraph this year of the influencers because uh, this initiative has really really shaken the space and made a lot of people realize um, you know what is behind this technology what is the impact not just on the economic level of a single individual or something that powers you know your creativity or your career growth but we always every little action we do actually has an impact on the entire world uh, and Polkadot is a proof of stake blockchain and according to the uh, recent studies by crypto carbon Ratings Institute, it is the most efficient and cleanest blockchain among proof of stake blockchains. Uh, there are lots of studies done about Ethereum and its impact on environment. And currently European Commission is actually um, debating whether or not to allow big organizations banking system to switch to Ethereum blockchain because of its impact on um, environment and carbon footprint. Uh, and uh, Ethereum was basically our kind of only alternative infrastructure that allowed for smart contracts that allowed to make agreements on the blockchain that are immutable, uh, you know, because it's not possible on Bitcoin blockchain, it has different um, application and, and use case and infrastructure. So now we have Polkadot, uh, which proved to be uh, very energy efficient and uh, digital art for climate is um, just one use case and one initiative that uh, that resulted to being fact impactful also for the fact that we used art and we um, uh, organized an art competition. 
uh, it was open call. So they actually work selected. They were not, majority of them were not done by professional artists with uh, CV and portfolio and with years being uh, calling themselves artists. So it was totally open for people who care about environment. And the results were really fascinating uh, because this art competition and uh, representing this artist at COP26 actually resulted um, to be a big impact in, in their career and a big, uh, we received a um, big resonance uh, in the art community as well as in the blockchain and tech community in general. So our winner, Briggs, uh, he was featured on the CNN. Uh, he, he now began actively um, to participate in different um, climate initiatives. Uh, he did already several drops and all of our artists, they share, uh, so part of their profits uh, from the NFT sales, they will go to climate action. Uh, we are collaborating with UN Habitat. They have an office in Kenya. They have um, schools, they have teenagers uh, who create art in different forms. So we're planning to extend this initiative to music industry, to performance arts, and we're taking part in MENA Climate Week uh, at the end of March, where we'll also have an, um, an art exhibition of our, uh, we'll feature our finalists and we will connect with other art and youth communities who care about environment and who find, uh, who found their way in expressing themselves and attracting attention to this uh, global challenge th through their art. Uh, and also, our participant, one of our participants who did not have a CV in art uh, world, she was selected by Super Rare to be a feature artist uh, in the community. And we're also planning as unique network to do integrations and enable minting on other platforms on large Ethereum marketplaces. There are several projects in the works right now because we want to give all artists the choice, at least conscious choice, uh, where they want to mean their artworks uh, and apart from them being uh, sure that it's uh, it's a clean infrastructure they're using, it's, uh, it's not energy consuming for their art. Also, it has a huge benefit of all the advanced features that Bruno mentioned because the substrate framework and the framework in which uh, we're building our tools that we consider should be um, available to every creator out there because everybody should have access to blockchain technology to nfts and um, crypto should be easy it should be as easy as uh, every creator right now can build their own website on on web2 the same thing um, should be available in web3 and this is what we're working towards too yeah we're looking forward to that. Um, and this is the reason why having these types of events and these discussions is so important, because I think it becomes a little bit more relatable when you start to hear it from people who explain it. I'd like to ask uh, just one else on the panel, because I'm conscious we are just a few minutes away before we go into the Q&A section. So I'm going to come back to you, Alexander, and ask you, from your experience as, as an entrepreneur, what are the opportunities for creators, startups, and companies? And what's the best advice you would give anyone looking to start a project on Web3? Well, uh, uh, Irina just uh, mentioned uh, the opportunities, uh, I think, for uh, creators and uh, for the startups is obviously an opportunity to reach uh, uh, more users and engage with uh, future users. Uh, obviously, there are some, well, uh, risks like regulative, speculative risks, but uh, uh, I think uh, it, the biggest risk is uh, if your team is not agile enough and uh, may die before you actually will be able to deliver something. So uh, another important thing uh, to uh, think about is that uh, don't do local things. They, uh, they don't work on no scale. If you are ready to launch a global project, from day one, uh, then uh, this would be the right choice for you. Yeah. And uh, uh, the uh, advice, well, I would say that uh, don't go down this rabbit hole, except if you are truly ready to engage with the community and build global solutions that you do not control. And this is a problem for many entrepreneurs. 
Yes, but uh, I'd say it's the best thing that can happen to you, but it needs completely different mindset. That's great. And I wish you a lot of luck with uh, World of Freight. Um, I see your racing games. Uh, I follow you on Twitter. So also for our guest speakers, if you want to drop your Twitter links into the main chat so that our um, audience can follow you and get in touch with you and ask you anything further once we've wrapped up the session. That's great. And I'm going to go over to you, Stefan, because I want to continue a little bit about uh, on the conversation of startups and developers and individuals doing things on the metaverse. What would be your advice? Uh, I think my advice would be be curious. Um, there's a lot of information out there there's a lot of communities there's a lot of goodwill within the space because everybody is creating this new future so before i think probably even necessarily deciding right web3 is right for me i would get fully immersed into the space and i think there's nothing like doing you need to go out there you need to join some communities you need to be an active member of some communities you need to own some nfts you need to own some cryptocurrency and it's pain frankly it's quite painful at the moment the ux isn't very good it'll get better it'll get a lot better and we need entrepreneurs and we need more people entering the space who bring different talents and different degrees of professionality into the space but yeah i would say reach out be hungry get your feet wet as Alexander says, it's a rabbit hole. Uh, once you go into it, you're probably not going to come back out of it. <laughs> um, and it's all consuming. But, you know, having said that, it's a lot of fun. And the potential is, it's, it's, it's enormous. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, get in there and uh, roll your sleeves up. Yeah. So, um, Bruno, over to you with the last question, even though I have um, had to leave out some of the questions. I think I went a little bit over the top with, with everything I wanted to ask each of you. Um, but let's go back to uh, what's the number one challenge with Metaverse today and how can RMRK help? Um, number one challenge with, with Metaverse today is um, exactly what we've mentioned before, so excessive centralization. Uh, most metaverses are just multiplayer games running on people's servers. Even those that you know as decentralized right now, that's decentralized sandbox and so on, these are also running on people's servers. And they can, when they go away, your experience in them goes away. Um, true metaverse is not about, you know, owning NFTs and stuff like that. Um, true metaverse is owning your experience. Uh, a metaverse is an environment in which... Uh, Digital representations of humans can interact with each other and keep that experience with them. That's that's the metaverse. Uh, everything else is a multiplayer game. And how you accomplish this is you let your avatar, your digital representation, grow. How you can let them grow is you can have mutable NFTs, which are not the solution. Some people have tried this. They centralize metadata. It doesn't really work with current standards. Um, the way to do it is actually to have NFTs that can own other NFTs, and then you can place those experiences inside of that NFT. And this is how you get true ownership of experience, because if that metaverse goes down, even if it's running on a centralized server, your experience goes with you. And another metaverse in the future can recognize your past achievements, your experience, whatever you've, you've done um, in the previous one. And so the main challenge is actually getting people to understand that metaverses today are not actually metaverses, that they're not decentralized and that we need, we have a long way to go until metaverses are decentralized. But until then you can have an NFT that's your avatar that can actually equip and own even something as, as meta as a skill. A skill can be an NFT. Uh, the avatar's brain can be an NFT into which you can equip skills, recipes, uh, crafting recipes, whatever else you want, alongside the equipment like a backpack, which is in itself an NFT, which can then contain other NFTs inside of itself. So as you get to this experience level, as you, as you get to this ownership level, you then realize that you are truly taking your digital identity with you and you're not just trying to compose it out of different NFTs that are then weirdly represented by each metaverse client software in a different way. 
So the major, the, what, that's, that's one major ch the challenge. The other major challenge is that everybody seems to be focusing on 3D. Um, 3D is not the most friendly environment for the next billion or so people to onboard into Web3 and metaverses. People just don't know how to navigate with the mouse or with WASD, and they definitely do not want to sit behind a computer to play. What they want is a casual experience where they can, you know, uh, wait for a bus or have a long poop, and they can just log, log into something even on their mobile device and not worry about having to log out in the proper location or even signing transactions being fished and so on. And so this is why we're, we're focusing on a super casual experience instead. As a gamer, I'm excited about 3D metaverses very much, but mm -hmm. I'm fully aware that my, my you know, like parents or, or non-technical friends are never going to log into Decentraland or Sandbox. So this is what, what the other challenge is and what we're working on. Yeah, I mean, I remember one of the really funny things about doing this event on the Metaverse was you could just click through from this event into um, into the uh, CryptoVox or space and most people didn't know what they were doing. So you could just see avatars floating around. My friend sent me a screenshot that she'd actually and over um, from one platform to another, but it was really fun, you know, having an event where you're just sitting behind a laptop to actually be there, being able to move around, um, see other people that were there too. Uh, I couldn't believe it, but it, it was really exciting. Another of the things that we've talked about during um, the Latin Summit was the POAPs and people using them now on their CVs in Latin America. Uh, so there are so many things that are just happening um, automatically are out of all the really interesting use cases. But I'm gonna add a little bit of advice and that is do your research. If you wanna get involved with Web3, the metaverse, crypto, whatever, do your research on the product projects that you are interested in. Your due diligence is everything. Read up, Google them, um, get involved, follow them on Twitter and ask the community uh, because that is how you will really find out if they're in it for the long term or not so. That's my advice from Gibraltar. So I'm going to quickly go into the Q&A and um, there's not many questions, I think, because we are just about wrapping up a, a very long session today. So one question is, any rough idea on how building a Web3 website would look like? Would it end up being as simple as a Web2 drag and drop? Who would like to take that one on? I can. Okay, go for um, it. It is that simple. The only difference is that you're now using a much more expensive and much less efficient database. That is the blockchain. Everything else is the same. You have the same elements, you have the same HTML, you have the same JavaScript, you have the same CSS. It is exactly the same, only you are no longer using usernames and passwords. You just have another package to include alongside your JavaScript dependencies, which will instead ask the user to, for example, sign a message with their crypto wallet. And this is all automated. You have packages that you can just include these days. Um, otherwise, it is exactly the same. The experience might be a little bit iffy because it is not usually very easy to extract historical data from the blockchain directly. And so if you're trying to find somebody's balance at a certain date in the past, this is not going to be very straightforward. So if you're building an app like that, you're going to have a hard time unless you put a database in between. And this is what most people are doing. There's a very famous database that people say is decentralized, but it's not. It's called the graph. Um, they put this in front of their Web3 application between, the, between their UI and the blockchain so that they have a, a set of indexed information that they can actually hook into as easily as with Web2. And so, in effect, it becomes as simple as Web2. Um, there are some caveats to, to be mindful of, like if your UI is submitting transactions and you need to be careful not to transmit two transactions too quickly in a row uh, because they can conflict then and so on. But all of this is usually abstracted away for you. And with these packages that we have today on offer, it is actually fairly simple to build for Web3. The, the bigger problem is actually the, the mental preparation because you need to be aware that one mistake, one bad mistake in your build process can cost people millions of dollars. And these millions of dollars are uninsured and unrefundable. So if you're okay with that level of risk, then you're ready to build for Web3. Okay. Um, there's another question here. What potential is there for virtual property and metaverse and blockchain? I think it's a little bit of a mixed question here, but maybe someone would like to take part of that. <laughs> I, can, I can give a quick answer on that. I mean, I think 
virtual property is already happening. Um, we're seeing that on various different metaverses. We've obviously seen since Zucker announced his, his name change and his plans for, for meta, the likes of Decentraland and, and Sandbox, you know, prices going 5x um, and demand, you know, going through the roof and, and more and more big brands entering the space. I think probably by and large not really knowing what they're doing a lot of it is still pr but i'd like to think you know we're, we're beginning to move beyond that and they are beginning to kind of experiment with uh, meaningful use cases and those are just two you know the two leading metaverses at the moment there is many more that are coming along um with different attributes on different chains um that we will find the same thing again i'm sure if you've got scarcity of land and people in the community buy into the uh, the vision of that metaverse, then it's not only an investment; it's also a means of uh, creating, you know, income streams on an ongoing basis, as well as being part of a community and 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 kind of growing uh, that vision. Thank you, um, Irina. I think you wanted to add something to that. Uh, yeah, well, totally agree with Stefan. There is a lot of there is a lot going on in the virtual space. Uh, also, real estate sector has been trying to find ways to uh, mass adopt blockchain technology. It's still not easy to explain to um, stakeholders and major real estate companies. You know the benefits of tokenization. Also, the transparency that blockchain offers is not always a good thing for um, for for transacting on, um, you know, to, not everybody's ready to um, uh, be fully transparent about transactions happening in the space. However, there are many solutions uh, that are being developed. And the point of, of the metaverse of what we're trying to build is that we're trying to connect the virtual world and the physical world in the most um, appealing sense. So we need people to enter, we need companies to enter, uh, we needed to have economy as well as easy user experience. So there are so many elements that need, need to be in place in order for us to see the real metaverse, that dream and vision that uh, builders of this space have. So there is plenty of work, plenty of opportunities for technical people, for non-technical people, even for philosophers and visionaries, economists, lawmakers. Uh, and what we are seeing, there is a lot of controversy. Uh, there are many and many more to, to be discovered because precisely this is a, a sandbox and experimental land. Uh, and hence, it's a very fascinating environment for building new things we're trying new things and this is what happens also in the real estate if you know real estate company cannot really go straight into tokenizing physical object they want to understand how it can potentially work in the virtual world would they have customers would actually commerce and businesses acquire that virtual commercial real estate instead of a physical one and how to then build a bridge between the physical um, world and the virtual world well, so we only have a couple of minutes left, but someone has asked about Web 4.0, and I think we're going to leave that one to the next session because it might get too complicated for today. But um, there's one last question I would like to ask because I think we're already seeing that with um, Facebook changing the name to Meta. But they're asking, is there a space for a brand new social media style platform built on blockchain and NFT content? Over to you. Um, there is. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are several experiments already in progress. Um, there's one called Subsocial, which is in the Kusama and Polkadot ecosystem. Their UX needs some love, but in essence, you are using a chain to um, store. So there's this interplanetary file system, IPFS, where when you store a, a file, you store it like on BitTorrent, like you would torrent pirated TV shows and stuff. Uh, that I'm sure nobody do, does. Um, so you would store them like that in, in among your peers, and then the blockchain uh, kind of makes a note of that particular address of that content um, so that it can find it later. And this subsocial leverage is this, this effect of the blockchain where you actually, when you post content, it goes onto this IPFS, but you use the blockchain to retrieve it. And you can already use this platform. We use it for all of our company communications. For example, our blog is entirely there in order to dog food 
Web3 as much as possible so that we are using what we're preaching. Um, there are other uh, projects to do this. Uh, there is Scent, which is kind of like a social platform with blockchain. There is Mirror. Um, there's even uh, Status, which is an organization I used to work for before. They tried to do um, a messenger for Ethereum. Now, all of these have terrible, terrible compromises. And all of them have um, like extreme uh, single points of failure where not nothing is really safe. But... There is like huge money being thrown at this problem because it is a problem in, in need of solving. Um, lots of research is being done on this. Every day we get a new advancement that just helps this move move ahead a little bit, little by little. So the the what I can tell you about where this is going in the immediate future, social, the platform that I mentioned, is actually going to be using Remark to turn their posts and comments into NFTs, which will allow you not only to own a post as an owner, but also to sell pieces of news and so on, so that you can do um, you know, extracted snippets from NFTs that become part of that NFT. And so then you have proof where some bit of information came from, but also you can trade information and, and um, apply reputation on these NFTs and, and other really interesting things that we're uh, happy to tell you about in the in the near future. So yeah, there are there are attempts at this, but it is really hard. Um, it's a really hard problem to solve because the the current infrastructure, the current incumbents of the ecosystem are not exactly fans of this approach of taking this control away from them. Cool. So it looks like we are at the very end of our session. I think any other questions that the attendees might have, they can get in touch with our guests directly, either by their Twitter feed or LinkedIn. Uh, I'm just going to wrap up this session saying that we are suffering through another uh, huge humanitarian crisis and our hearts are all with uh, trying to achieve peace as quickly as possible for Ukraine and for the citizens of Russia. So I just wanted to um, thank you all for being here today. I know for some of you, it can be a very difficult situation that we are living through for some more than others, uh, but we are all trying our best to do everything we can to help and through the use of uh, tech also. I've seen lots of uh, blockchain and different projects trying to raise funds. So as hard as it is, we will do our best. Again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the team who have participated in this session with me. I think Kelvin, who is the chapter director from Helsinki, is quickly going to join now so we can um, finish the session today. But I, from Gibraltar, I'm going to quickly thank my sponsors because they make it possible for me to be here. So Hassan's International Law Firm, Digital Asset Management, Gibraltar Finance, Jib Telecom, Abacus Financial Services, and SRG Europe. Thank you, thank you so much for supporting me in my quest to share this education with my community. So over to Kelvin whenever he's ready. Hi, Denise. I'm actually going to step in for Kelvin. Um, okay. You. It's really <laughs> nice to be elsewhere, unfortunately. Um, you've said, well, said it very well already, Denise, in terms of a thank you. Um, I'll echo that to say a huge thanks to the panel. Such an incredible discussion. Uh, huge thanks to our guest earlier, uh, Radha, who is a brilliant, brilliant speaker as well. And oh, the main thing really was what I think is quite an exciting announcement. Um, so anyone who's attending, uh, you actually entered into a free well, competition to win a free ticket to in-person or virtual uh, at Global 2020. Uh, as you guys might have seen, we, we have our global conference that started going every year. And the main topic really for 2022 is Web3. So it's a kind of perfect introduction today uh, in, in many respects. Um, so look out for announcements in terms of winners. And the other thing for me is um, please please shout about what you've learned today. Um, I'll see many of the speakers on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn as well. Uh, all you need to do, guys, just tag us at Start Grind. Uh, you can also hashtag Web3 Month. Uh, anything that's really resonated with you, we'd love to hear it. Uh, obviously, we'll, we'll retweet and give it some likes and uh, a bit of love as well. And otherwise, thanks again, everyone, and uh, hope to see you very, very soon. Thank you so much, and we will be in touch with you soon. Take care. Have Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Okay. 